Freightliners started making entrees, uh, wanting me to join them. And as soon as I told the guys in the band, well, I'm going to join the Coastliners, they said, no, 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 you're going to be in our band. So that's how mm -hmm. I got in the band. And it had started from a group called the, the, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, the Jim Askins Combo. It was a mm -hmm. St. Thomas High School band called the Jim Askins Combo. And Jim Askins had quit the band, and so they couldn't use that name anymore, so they cho chose Sixpence. And so we went on from there, and we uh, we fell in love with Walt Anderson and vice versa. And uh, as Rob could tell you, Rob was one of uh, Rob would tell you that Walt was one of the most incredible uh, talents behind the board. Absolutely and, and amazing. Magnificent, magnificent yeah. ears, and just just wonderful person to work with. And uh, he got assigned with uh, an outfit, uh, and and he asked Gary Zeekley, who had uh, a real great songwriter from L.A., to to write a song for us. Or actually, he had already written one, and it was called Elephant Candy. And so they said, we want you to do Elephant Candy. So we did it, <laughs> and th that was it, boy. Once once we started there, and then uh, and and then we did an album. Lou Cabasa from San Antonio, from the Children, mm -hmm. another mm -hmm. band. He wrote, he did all the arrangements and stuff like that. And they, Walt formed a company called Gulf Pacific Industries, and that melded the the L.A. connection with the Houston connection. A guy named Don Altfeld, and uh, mm -hmm. we we started Steve off with Steve Zach. Yeah, but we started off with a, with a band, with a, a hit called Summer Girl. And that got me a, an opportunity to let my fall set a swing, and and uh, it just went from there. And I mean, we were not a heavy rock band. We were we were more like the Association, a lot like the Beach Boys, but in between. And uh, uh, we just had a ball, and and I'm still doing it. And, and you know, it's it's. I've always thought the greatest thing in the world is to hear a bunch of guys singing together, and mm -hmm. it's very fun to listen to. And that, so I still am on that same haunt, you know. I'm going after it. And we play it all the time. Yeah. And that's how I got started. And Rob, you want to talk about Walt Anderson's studio and when you guys, you and Dennis, uh, recorded there? Talk a, well, talk a little bit uh, the first album, yeah. Uh, the, Sam really nailed it when he said that Walt yeah. had amazing ears. He, um, he, he could hear. <clears throat> Walt, uh, Walt was, first of all, a, a gentleman. And had a great uh, decorum about him and um, we always loved going out to the studio and and working with Walt Scott uh, and Vivian always were in the booth with Walt and they had great ideas as did Walt but they were always very open to everything that we wanted to do we we'd think well let's try this or let's uh, let's see if this works and on, on I remember on one tune that Dennis sang so great uh, called Nowadays Clancy Can't Even Sing. We decided to put a backward piano on there and I wrote the piano part out and played it backwards and Walt ran the tape backwards and got this great effect on there and Walt was open to to anything and everything and um, I, it was always a pleasure to be out there in his studio and he always made us feel very special like we were the group that he wanted to record and there were many groups he recorded but he always made us feel like we were very very special uh, and don't, don't, forget what, guys, he... don't forget frank davis <clears throat> oh yeah, oh, yeah. Frank. <laughs> oh, yeah frank. <laughs> frank was was uh, an amazing person too yeah he was he delivered i'll tell you this is joe ford again he delivered yeah. uh, great products to radio stations too we all all of us in, in the broadcasting business look forward to uh, any of the sessions that were done there because they were always clean they were always mixed well and um you know it just he, he the guy knew what he was doing he was he was he, an he interesting did a great person product. He sure yeah did. he did and let's not discount um uh, the larry kane show larry was oh yes i was getting wrong that yeah definitely. amazing force for all of us and uh I've, at one point, Fever Tree even became sort of the house band on the show for a while, and boy, he was a he was a great uh, boost to all the Houston groups. Great, great guy, too. Great guy. Yeah, 
he was a lawyer. He did some of our, our law work. His name was Harry Lieberman, and mm-hmm. he did a lot of our law work for us on contracts. And didn't, um, if you played Friday night at the Catacombs, you would be on Larry Kane the next day? Wasn't there something like that going Gosh, on? I don't remember that. Do you, Dennis? Oh, not, no, just... <laughs> oh. not necessarily. Not okay. necessarily. Uh, Bob Cope, who was running the Catacombs at that yeah. time, after the, Steve Gladson left, uh, they they had a a, a, a a sort of arrangement, but it didn't happen that way always. No, well, I'll be I'll be honest with you. Uh, yeah, I'm very proud to announce that uh, Six Sixpence was the first band to ever uh, do live music on the Larry King. Kerry wow. Richards yeah. said, "We want you, we want y'all to do it because it's kind of experimental, and we don't know if anybody can do it." And, we're going to use your career. <laughs> wow. well, I great. didn't know that. That's great. I never knew that. That's great. I never yeah. knew that. That's great. Yeah. Hey, I'm, uh, <laughs> this is Neil. This is Neil Ford again. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned Terry Richards because mm-hmm. he was the uh, he was the director of that show, and Kerry was talented. super talented. He he made that show look like a national program. Yeah, he yeah, did. Sure Very did. good. Yeah. Truly did. That's right. Yeah. Hey, Nikki, yeah. This is. To the click again, uh, uh-huh. we would uh, did uh, Larry Kane numerous times, and we absolutely loved doing it. But what was interesting, I didn't realize that all Walt Andrus was getting all the bands in in his studio, but we never really kind of knew that by the way he sequenced us in and out. But a typical day for us would be, let's say, Larry Kane on a Saturday morning would go rehearse in the afternoon, would do a show that night and then we'd go into waltz somewhere around midnight and then sometime after that either we would we might go to love street light circus and watch billy gibbons in his early blues episode so <laughs> mm-hmm. that was a day for us in houston yeah wow <laughs> so <laughs> great one of the things i want to ask vicky i want to ask okay because so now we're getting an idea of what was coming out of Houston. Talk about uh, what made you decide to write this. Well, it just kind of came to me, I guess. Um, I was thinking one day about, you know, the happiest times in my life, which um, would have been going to teen dances and hearing all these guys play. And Uh I just loved it. I couldn't get enough of it. I was a little bit on the young side, so I guess, you know, kind of a teeny bopper. I didn't really understand what was going on, but I just knew I loved it, and I waited all week for the weekend so I could go have more of it. So and later in life, so I was... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, true. We all did. <laughs> well, later in life, you know how you reflect back on things, and I was thinking, you know, when was I the happiest, and that's that's the time. So I thought wonder what ever happened to some of these bands that we all just adored, you know. I'd like to find out if I could. So I started looking on the Internet and trying to find them. I think Neil Ford was the first person I found. And I didn't really know how to do it, but I thought I want to capture these memories for myself and for other people. Because if I'm interested, I'm sure a lot of other people are interested. And Neil was so sweet and so professional you know, he, I'm sure he could tell I was a nervous wreck. The first interview that I did was with him, and I just kept saying, that's cool, that's cool, to everything he said. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I went back and listened to it, and I thought, well, I'm going to have to get better at it <laughs> than that. Vicky, but, I, was lo- I was lonely. well you were patient with me and i appreciate that you didn't scare me off from my task so i i did get better i think as i went along and all the guys are so sweet you know they just share their memories and everybody works together and i really appreciated them pointing me in the right direction when i didn't really know you know what i was doing and they would say if you've gone, you know, this route, then you want to be sure and talk to B.J. Thomas, and you want to be sure and cover this venue. They just gave me a roadmap all along the way. Mm-hmm. Vicki, did anybody ever talk to you about Dean Scott? Oh, yeah. uh, somebody should. I was wondering if anybody yeah. was going to mention that. You know, he was... Oh, he I was, was going to mention him. Oh, Dean, my God. I, t- I talked to Dean. I talked to Dean about once every, every couple of months, and he's, uh, you know, I think he secretly really wants to get back in there. Here was a guy... 
that probably had one of the most amazing voices I have ever heard in my life, really. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. He's got like, what, five octaves or something like that. But he, um, he, when the Righteous Brothers came to town, the first person they asked about was, where is Dean Scott? And I had no idea he was as big as he was in California Incredible. at the time. Incredible. And it, he had his own fan club out there, and I think Sally Struthers was the president of the fan club, and he had celebrities like Jack Nicholson that were, you know, fans of his. This guy was amazing, and he never had a hit record. <laughs> yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah, Charles. Uh, yeah, he, was, he, <coughs> he was the Go highest paid musician in Houston uh, working at the Village Inn Pizza Parlor. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. He, he, and, he and Bobby Braddock. Six hundred dollars a night, you know, and you know, and he worked there anytime he wanted to. And back then, six hundred dollars was a big bunch of pay. Yeah, mm -hmm. it yeah. was. It was. Vicky, well, guys, this is this, this is Neil Ford. I, 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 in my opinion, Dean Scott may be the best vocalist I've ever heard. Um, oh, yeah. He, he's, he's, yeah, he's, he's living he's amazing. amazing. He is. He's living out in Marble Falls, and uh, yeah, I used to own a club. I used to own a club in Dallas for a while, and and whenever I would go, I would I'd be playing my club, and then I'd go out to the Saharas in Reno and Tahoe and Vegas, and I'd always I'd like to bring in Dean Scott. I just thought he was the best, and so uh, let me, let me and, the, and there was and there were some other great uh, uh, vocalists that I want to mention while we're on the air. And what is B.J. Thomas, who is a fantastic mm -hmm. voice, and has oh, sold yeah. millions. B.J., yeah, B.J. B.J. is probably one of my closest friends. He's a he's a yeah. sweet, sweet guy, and you know, yeah. his voice has never changed. It's just gotten better no. over the years. He's wonderful. And then you've, got, amazing. Uh, you've got Gary Smith, who used to have the plantation downtown, and the yeah. Texas Breeze. Yeah. Gary Smith is a fine entertainer and vocalist. Yeah. 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 Whatever yeah. happened to uh, I hate... I hate I hate to sound like a promotion man, but on the 26th <laughs> of, of, of March, Duck Soup's going to play the Saxon Pub, and Dean Scott is going to be our special guest. Oh, You're oh, kidding. Yes. Uh, he hasn't right. performed in over two years. He hasn't performed wow. in two years. Yeah. He told me the there. last time I talked to him, he wants to, um, you know, he wanted to say, you tell, he, was re he really wanted to get back out into the, you know, out into the public he's, again. He's been, and he's been real sick. He's been yeah, real sick. Yeah, he really time. has. But he's, he's coming What's that down. date, and where is it, Sam? What's the date and, and, and location? The, the, the 26th of, of March. And where Sam, is it, Sam? Rob, do you the need Saxon a keyboard Club. for that gig? <laughs> we got plenty of them. That's the X O N. Where is that, Sam? Rob, 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 I'll let you play any time. Okay. Is that Houston? Yeah. It's in Austin. 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 Bruce uh, Bruce uh -huh. Bruce here. I, I, you, you asked a really poignant question a while ago that that I know we we all agree with, and that is Vicky writing this book. If I could rewind to that point just yes. briefly, because I think all of us, as we've moved through our life and gotten older, as we have, we look back in the rearview mirror at that era of all of our lives that we shared and we really did think it was in the rearview mirror we've all gone to a new careers and done new things with families and children and grandkids and all that cool stuff but with vicky kind of re gender kindling the greatness that was the talent that was coming out of that part of houston it's touched all of our lives in a way we never anticipated absolutely that's right Absolutely. Vicky, you did a great job on that book. Actually, it was, yeah, it was Vicky. You were pers you were persistent and you were thorough, and it was full of all of your heart and soul. You did a great yeah, job. You really Vicky, did. Is, Vicky, isn't that book in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame now? Yes. Good oh, very girl. good. Good yeah, for you. Very good. That's great. And, and Vicky, you're gonna you're working on a second book. Yes, I that, am. Right? I... Okay. Uh, Bill D. Laverne and I are doing uh, Houston 70s. We're going to 